Hello everyone. Um, today uh, we are going to talk about uh, how we perform aggregation in uh, graph neural networks. So um, just starting uh, with a brief recap from the last time. So basically we have seen uh, in several tutorials how we basically from an input graph we uh, can construct a computation graph based on the information of uh, the neighbors of one node and uh, how we basically, in order to obtain uh, some a representation for one node, we have to uh, aggregate and maybe transform through some neural networks the information of the neighbors of uh, one specific node. So here, for instance, you see that uh, the node F has uh, three neighbors, which are uh, A, B, and D, and uh, we need to aggregate the information of these three nodes. So basically, uh, we want to use some permutation invariant functions because uh, the number of uh, neighbors is usually a set, so it's, it does, doesn't have a fixed size, and uh, uh, the order in which we take the neighbors shouldn't be um, something uh, to consider in this aggregation. And um, in most of the graph neural network ar architectures, uh, we uh, see that uh, authors use uh, some average or uh, max uh, functions because they are actually permutation invariant uh, and they are very easy to compute. So for instance, in the graph convolutional network model, uh, they use the, the average. Uh, in graph sage, uh, they use the maximum, the average and uh, LSTM, which is not a real good choice here and I will tell you later why. Uh, and then also we have seen that uh, in the graph attention um, network, um, they use uh, the sum uh, aggregation function. So just to give you an overview of what we are going to talk today. So uh, uh, our first topic we are going to touch is the weiss feiler lemon isomorphism test and why it is useful for uh, determining the best class of our aggregation functions that we can construct. Uh, we're going to switch to the graph isomorphism networks, uh, which are um, a new class of uh, graph neural networks, which implement this idea from uh, the Weisfeiler uh, Lehmann isomorphism test. Uh, we will see how they perform uh, the actual aggregation using some decomposition strategies. And uh, we're going to uh, also see some other uh, techniques, for instance, the principal neighborhood aggregation and uh, learning aggregation functions. Uh, last, we are going to see how we can uh, implement these uh, aggregation functions in PyTorch Geometric. So starting from um, the weisfeiler lemma isomorphism test, so what is uh, isomorphism, by the way? Uh, isomorphism is the, uh, defined as uh, determining if two graphs are topologically identical. So basically, if they have the uh, an identical structure, okay? Uh, formally, it's defined as a bijection between the nodes of the two graphs. And why is it useful? Because, uh, so for instance, imagine that uh, we have a graph, we know some properties of the graph, and um, we have another graph which is identical in the structure. So uh, if the two graphs are isomorphic, we can uh, infer some information for the second graph from the previous one, because they are actually uh, the same, they have the same structure. So um, the weisfeiler lehmann uh, isomorphism test is uh, an algorithm that uh, helps us to define if two graphs are uh, isomorphic. So basically if they have this, uh, uh, this uh, equal structure. This is uh, um, an old algorithm from 1968, but it's still, uh, let's, let's say that it's the holy grail of uh, the graph models out there. So I will give you uh, an introduction on how uh, this test works. So basically, uh, in order for determining if these two graphs have uh, identical structure, uh, we start by uh, coloring the nodes, okay? So basically, um, uh, here you see that uh, I have colored the nodes in green, but also you can use some um, um, alphabets, okay? So it works uh, either with colors, with alphabets, with the symbols, whatever. Um, just um, you need uh, basically um, 
uh, an alphabet yes of uh, uh, symbols in this case we're gonna it's gonna be color because it's called also a color refinement algorithm so uh, basically the algorithm starts like this we assign to every node in the graph this very same color and uh, in order to basically uh, determine if uh, the two graphs are the same we're gonna refine the colors of each node based on the uh, structuring structural information of each node and the colors of uh, the neighborhood basically so to do this uh, what we do is we define a new color for the for the uh, for uh, each step uh, in which basically we um, here you can see that we basically take uh, the value of each uh, specific node and uh, it's uh, basically uh, the multiset of its uh, neighbors okay and based on this information we compute a new color for uh, the nodes so in this case here by using this um, uh, this recoloring uh, strategy I obtain these two graphs which now have this distribution of the colors okay so here we have that uh, this node for instance has uh, its green and it has just one um, one green neighbor so basically we decided to recolor it as red okay so here uh, the new color for this node will be red also this node has this um, this structural structural information so also this node will be uh, colored in red and we do it for uh, each node basically um, uh, after each step because it's uh, an iterative process after each step we can uh, check basically if the distribution of the colors of the two graphs are the same and if they are the same we continue uh, are refining the colors uh, until uh, the colors uh, of the, um, the distribution of the colors are different or if uh, a certain number of steps is met basically so here for uh, giving you another example we start from these previous two uh, graphs okay for the second step we take these two graphs we define another coloring strategy and we recolor uh, the two graphs so here we see that uh, basically the distribution of the colors is the same so we will do it for a third step a fourth step and again and again and again um, and uh, basically I, I will tell you now I will not show you all the steps but these two graphs are actually isomorphic so basically uh, they have the very same structure for this test so to uh, put it more formally uh, this uh, refining color refining uh, strategy that I've told you about um, let's put it in a formula which is basically this one so basically here we have a function uh, of the color of the observed node and the color of the neighbors of this node and uh, in order to obtain a new unique color we need this function h to be an injective function so an injective function is a function for which uh, for each distinct input you have a, uh, a distinct output okay so the vice filer uh, Lehmann isomorphism test is one of the best uh, methods that you have out there to determine isomorphism because of its complexity um, as I told you before if you know some information uh, about one graph and you have a graph which is isomorphically um, which is isomor isomorph to uh, the, pr the first graph we can also infer some new information also for the nodes because uh, the nodes are uniquely colored uh, based on this injective function so basically then if you have a function that takes the call the, the, the information of the nodes uh, after several steps of the of the isomorphism test and try to compute some values since they are uniquely colored then you will have um, some distinct information for each node which can uh, be used for determining uh, the category of the node and these kind of things uh, this test uh, can distinguish most graphs no, not all of them but in practice uh, um, in practice you use it uh, anyway because even though it's not uh, gonna distinguish all the possible combination of graphs uh, still the vast majority of it it can distinguish uh, by the way the Weisfeiler Lehmann test has a very limited use in practice because actually uh, in graph neural network you are not interested in determining if two graphs are exactly the same maybe but you uh, also want uh, to have information about uh, to which degree they are similar for instance okay so uh, 
uh, you don't really use isomorphism, isomorphism test uh, in, um, uh, in graph neural networks because of this reason, mostly. Um, but uh, because of the injectivity of this function, basically, we have that uh, the isomorphism test is a very powerful tool we can use. So uh, authors and research, I mean, researchers have uh, started questioning. So can we co can we construct uh, graph neural networks that are as pa at least as powerful as the Weisfeller isomorphism test? Uh, and the, the answer is yes. And uh, the authors of uh, the paper uh, linked below, which is how powerful are graph neural networks, uh, came up with this uh, new graph neural network technique, which is called graph isomorphism network, uh, in which they basically um, state that they can construct um, uh, graph neural networks, which are as powerful as the Weisfeiler lemon test. So how does this uh, graph neural network work? So basically, uh, this is the idea. This is the, uh, the idea between uh, Sorry, let, let me disable the notification. So this is the idea um, behind, sorry, the, uh, the, um, the graph isomorphism network. So basically, uh, if we have two graphs, G and G prime, which are non-isomorphic, and we have a graph neural network A, um, which map these graphs into uh, an embedding for each node, um, a the most powerful graph neural network uh, <clears throat> is a network that <clears throat> can basically map each node uh, of the two graphs in a way that if the two graphs are not isomorphic, the embeddings will be different. So basically, if the two graphs uh, are non-isomorphic, the embeddings will be different, and the Weisfeiler lemon will decide that they are not isomorphic too. Okay. Um, in order to uh, construct uh, such a GNN, to be sure that uh, such a GNN will produce this kind of uh, theoretical uh, result, the author says that we need a function, uh, a graph neural network, which implements these, um, the functions in these ways, for instance. So uh, the function f, which is the one responsible for aggregating the information of the neighbor, and uh, the function phi, which is the one that takes the information of the observed node and the, um, uh, and the uh, aggregated neighborhood, uh, should be both injected. Again, injectivity here is, uh, uh, is something that uh, we uh, really want to, uh, to obtain in some way, which is actually kind of hard because uh, many functions are maybe injective for sets, but not for multisets, which is what we are looking here because uh, the information from the nodes could be uh, distinct for each um, for each neighbor, but also uh, s there are some nodes that might have this very same information. So that's why we're talking about multisets. So um, so this is uh, the theoretical uh, achievement that that uh, that we want to get. So basically, uh, construct a neural network for which phi and f are injected. How do we do it? Uh, how do we do it? Through uh, some decomposition, uh, which is a technique uh, presented by uh, Zahir et al. in the paper Deep Sets. And basically, um, in, this, um, in this paper, the authors say that, um, uh, that basically every injective function of multisets can be decomposed as um, the combination of uh, um, the co uh, sorry the um, it can be decomposed as the summation of uh, one functions which is the f function which operates on the elements of the set and um, another uh, readout function which is in this case the phi function okay so basically uh, an injective function g uh, can be decomposed in such a way and they say that uh, there exists at least uh, one function f and one function phi for which this condition holds. So basically, this uh, summation uh, still produces an injective function. Okay, so this is the theoretical, um, I will not prove it, uh, just take it for granted. Uh, the, the, the proof is actually uh, quite long to, the, to, to show, to demonstrate. 
But let's see how uh, the authors of a uh, graph isomorphism network um, paper use this concept for uh, constructing the graph neural network. So basically, they say, okay, given uh, the sum decomposition, we can construct um, a neural network which takes here, you see the embedding uh, of a node and its uh, relational neighborhood, and um, and that has this form, which is basically uh, very similar to this one, which is very similar uh, to this one. Okay, so uh, there is one further step that uh, the authors say, uh, take, which is um, this function uh, phi and this function f actually uh, can be represented by a multilayer perceptron because uh, multilayer perceptrons, graph neural networks, can represent combination of functions uh, because of the universal approximation theorem uh, of Chibenko, uh, 1989. So, um, thanks to this uh, theoretical guarantee, they say, okay, let's use uh, a multilayer perceptron for representing uh, the functions phi and f, the combination of the two. And so basically, now we have the final form of the of the um, of the graph neural network uh, layer at the step k, which is this one. So basically, we got rid of the function f here, which is the one responsible for transforming the, um, the 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 representation of the neighbor nodes. Okay, and we combine the two together, and we end up having basically this form in which uh, here, okay, they basically assign um, um, basically how much contribution the node uh, of the, ob uh, sorry, the representation of the obs observed node has based on this parameter epsilon and uh, the summation of uh, the, re the representations, the embeddings of the neighbors, okay? Cool, so now we have the, basically the, the the schema for uh, obtaining the abandonings for the nodes in uh, the gene uh, setting, in the graph isomorphism network setting. However, there are some drawbacks, which is that um, the sum decomposition approach that we have seen, it has been proven to have um, some very highly discontinuous functions, because that's true that uh, there should exist uh, a function phi and a function f for which the summation, uh, as explained before, is still injective, but also there are some functions that uh, produce very highly discontinuous uh, mappings. So basically, this is something that you want to avoid if you uh, want to use these functions in a fully uh, differentiable, uh, so in an end-to-end -end architecture, okay? Um, also, they have proven, uh, uh, some other uh, authors here, Wagstaff and Al, uh, proved that uh, in order for f to ensure injectivity, it should map uh, the embeddings of the of the nodes into a, represent a latent representation which is higher than uh, the number of the nodes in the set. Okay, so this is a theoretical result, but this is um, a necessary condition for uh, all the sum decomposition uh, uh, stuff to work, basically. Also, uh, okay, we are using MLP to represent this, the, the composition of these two functions. There should exist these two functions, but we have no uh, practical guarantee to find these right functions for which the summation, uh, the sum decomposition is still injected. So even though uh, on the theory, everything seems nice, there are some uh, practical drawbacks. Um, okay, so, we have seen Jin, which uh, is actually, it is a very powerful method. It uh, got very, um, very nice state of the art results in many tasks. But this is just uh, one of the ways in which you can construct um, aggregations for, uh, meaningful aggregations for uh, graph neural networks. Um, I mean, despite of using just the average, the max or the, um, or the sum functions. Another technique uh, that can be used is called uh, the principal neighborhood aggregation. This is a very recent paper from last year. And uh, it uses 
uh, another kind of uh, strategy, which is uh, for performing the aggregation, uh, we use here, a, um, basically, we select the best combination of different ag aggregators and different scalars for um, basically um, for adjusting the values based on the um, on the size of the neighbor nodes okay so um, here uh, the idea is that you have a section in which you have <coughs> a library of aggregators so instead of using just uh, the mean the maximum the sum whatever you use uh, many different aggregators okay and you combine the values uh, obtained for this, uh, with these uh, different aggregators, you combine it with scalars, uh, with uh, scalars that uh, use basically the size of the neighbor to, um, to, um, um, to adjust the values of the, uh, of the aggregators. Uh, these are logarithmic scalars and uh, they work like this. So basically, uh, they have defined in the paper three scalars. One is the identity scalar, basically, in which uh, you don't perform any scaling. Uh, the other two are called amplification and attenuation scaling. And uh, they basically um, compute, um, they compute uh, the logarithm of the, um, the number of nodes in the neighborhood uh, over um, a cost, uh, yes, a constant value delta here, uh, which is based on the average, basically, uh, degree of the logarithm uh, in the training set of the of the incoming nodes for uh, of the neighbors, basically, of each node. Okay. Um, so this is one uh, technique, uh, which is let's call library based, in which you select which one is the best. Uh, something else that you can do is to get rid of um, basically using some known aggregation functions and learn it, okay? Uh, this is actually a paper that I've written with uh, some colleagues of mine and uh, in which basically what we define is uh, a learnable aggregator, meaning that uh, we have uh, for each uh, for each set okay we use a combination of uh, sorry um, for each aggregation we use a combination of four uh, different norms okay in which uh, the exponent of the norms and uh, some basically um, some parameters um, some sc rescaling parameters are learnable parameters so something that you can learn directly from, uh, from the data. So imagine that you take this laugh function, you plug it as uh, your aggregation component, and uh, it basically learns uh, the right parameters here to adjust uh, the output to, um, to have better performances of your model, basically. Um, one interesting thing is that based uh, determining um, so basically, um, by choosing specific parameters for uh, these four functions, you can achieve some very well-known uh, functions, for instance, like the maximum, the minimum, the sum, the average, uh, different moments uh, of the multiset, other functions like the minimum over the maximum, how many elements the, the, the multiset has, and so on and so forth. So this is a very um, flexible uh, strategy to learn um, to learn the, 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 the best aggregation for your data. Uh, this, is the, this is how uh, the aggregation component works in LAF. So basically here, imagine that you have uh, n, um, n vectors, okay, which represent basically uh, the embeddings of uh, the neighbor nodes, okay? And you have several LAF functions, which basically learn to aggregate um, element-wise the values of these vectors. So basically here you have that uh, laugh one aggregates all these three values and uh, produce one value. All these uh, second uh, component values and produce another value and so on and so forth. So we'll, in the end, you will end up having um, 
one basically um, uh, one vector for each LAF units that you have used. And uh, basically then what we do is we reduce uh, this representation to just a, a single vector um, uh, instead of having n uh, r different vectors by using a multilayer perceptron. Okay, so so far we have seen these uh, unusual uh, techniques to perform aggregation on graphs. Uh, now, uh, how do we implement this thing in uh, Python geometric? So. Uh, last time, uh, we uh, were checking how the message passing uh, um, class is implemented and uh, we have seen that uh, there are several methods uh, in the message passing that we can override. In this case, we are interested in overriding this method, which is aggregate, which is actually the component in the message passing uh, class in which the aggregation takes place. Okay, so I will switch now to the to the notebook. Okay, so um, here um, here I will show you how we can um, how we can implement uh, the PNA PNA um, aggregation layer and the learning and the laugh layer. Uh, because actually the gene layer is already implemented, uh, but we will construct uh, a neural network also with that uh, with that uh, layer, that uh, convolutional layer. So basically, uh, let us import torch. Uh, I, I like to fix the the manual seed in order to have reproducible results. So uh, as I was saying, by checking um, which are the methods of the message passing class we can see that here we have a method which is called aggregate and another one which is called message and aggregate i will tell you um, now what is the difference so basically in the aggregate method we use uh, i mean the, the, the library uses a, a very specific uh, schema to aggregate the information which is the one represented, uh, depicted by this image, and I will tell you how it works in a in a one second. Um, otherwise, if you instead of using this schema, you want to use the adjacency adjacency matrix of the graph, you should use the message and aggregate method, okay? Uh, because uh, this is specifically designed if you have adjacency matrix which are um, which are represented in a sparse format instead of a dense format. So the, the aggregation in the aggregate method, it is usually performed in this way. So basically imagine that we have um, these values uh, in input, which is uh, this vector here, and you have another vector, which basically tells you uh, the membership of each input cell to uh, the proper multiset. So basically, imagine that here these are the values obtained from uh, several different neighborhoods in the graph, okay? And you have an index uh, vector saying, okay, this, this, and this, indexed by the, the value zero, belong to the very same neighborhood. So basically, these three values belong to the same neighborhood and they should be aggregated together. Whereas uh, another, um, Another multi multi set is composed just by the value here, indexed by one, and another multi set is indexed by two, and uh, is basically these two values here, and so on. Okay. Um, in um, in the Pytorch geometric, uh, we can also decide which function we can use to aggregate these uh, these input values based on this indexing vector. Uh, here you can see that uh, we use the, the summation, but also uh, okay um, the summation. But also you can use uh, other functions like the maximum or uh, the minimum, I guess. So this is um, basically the aggregation schema how it works in standard PyTorch geometric. Okay, so in all the convolution layers in which you see that 
they use the summation or the maximum, uh, they use this, um, this schema for uh, aggregating the values, okay? We uh, are gonna use something very similar uh, for both the PNA and the laugh method. So let's go on. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So um, now we're gonna implement our uh, laugh layer inside of the uh, uh, graph isomorphism network convolution uh, layer, which is already defined in uh, PyTorch geometry. Okay. Under the module torchgeometric.nn. So basically here, uh, what we are gonna do is we are gonna extend the function aggregate of uh, gene convolutional uh, layer, which uh, is a class that extends uh, message, the message passing class. So basically um, we are still uh, changing the aggregate function of uh, message passing, but using also all the forward methods and uh, the other kind of computation uh, already implemented in the graph isomorphism network convolution. Okay, so um, here we are gonna define uh, what we need to, to change is, uh, well, the initialization of the functions because we want to specify how many uh, laugh units we wanna use. So basically the number of units are here for performing the different ag aggregations. Uh, also, uh, we can specify here the way to initialize the weights, the a, B, gamma, delta, uh, weights that I was showing before. Um, and also uh, we need to know the dimension of the embeddings because uh, we need to perform basically a transformation from this set of uh, vectors here to uh, just um, a single vector representation. So um, the step here, uh, in the aggregate function. So as you can see, it's a function that takes uh, an input, uh, the inputs, so the, basically the embeddings of the node and uh, the index vector, as I was showing you in the scatter aggregation. So basically uh, this in the, in the aggregation function, in the aggregate method will be not just single values, but uh, vectors, okay, of values. And still we have uh, the index here, which says, uh, to which multiset these embeddings uh, belong to, okay? Um, first of all, we need, uh, okay, to transform the input values uh, through a sigmoid because laugh actually uh, accept, uh, accepts inputs which are uh, just in zero one, uh, not, uh, uh, not all uh, um, real values. Um, okay, so uh, here we perform the aggregation using, uh, again, our laugh layer, uh, the transformed uh, values, and uh, we pass the index in order to know which multisets to aggregate. Since our output will be this set of uh, values here, we um, basically reshape it by uh, using the number of units that we have uh, chosen and the dimension of the embeddings and we pass it later through uh, a multi-layer perceptron, which output dimension is the actual uh, dimension of the node embedding, okay? And uh, this, is, uh, this is basically it. So what will be returned by uh, this function is the actual, um, the actual um, nodes, uh, the, the actual aggregation uh, of each uh, neighborhood um, in the graph. Okay, the same goes basically for uh, the principal neighborhood aggregation. Again, I will put you here the, um, the reminder or on how it works. Uh, here again, we are gonna use the scatter, um, the scatter techniques that I showed you before. Um, also here I have specified the delta I calculated by hand on training set. Uh, because it was a little bit too tricky to uh, uh, put it directly uh, from the data, so I computed it. And um, okay, so um, here you see we don't need to uh, specify any uh, any new uh, layer or whatever, just uh, the multi-layer perceptron layer, which is this last here, okay, this neural network here. And uh, okay, so since we have said that here we use multiple aggregators and then a combination with the scalars, 
what we do here is exactly this. So basically, uh, we use we initially compute uh, the aggregation representation using the sum, the maximum, the means, the variance. Um, note that uh, here, since um, uh, we are using a library based aggregators, we can put many more. So for instance, here we can put also uh, the mom, the third, the second, I mean, the variance is the second moment, but uh, we can also use the skewness, the kurtosis, which are the third, the fourth moment, uh, some other functions, doesn't, care, doesn't matter. We can make this list as long as we, as we want, although in practical it's not suggested. Um, after we have computed all these aggregations, we combine it with the scalars, uh, so basically here we compute uh, the, um, the, the logarithm of the degree of uh, each node, okay? And we use this information to uh, construct basically uh, the new aggregated version with uh, the amplification scalar or the attenuation scalar, as I was uh, telling you before. And then uh, we combine the information obtained with these two scalars into uh, the information obtained uh, with the uh, with the normal aggregators, which is basically as using the uh, identity scalar, which basically does nothing. Okay, uh, here then again we pass it through the uh, multi-layer perceptron, and we return the aggregated values. Okay, so as you can see, uh, performing some custom aggregation in uh, in Python geometric, basically boils down to uh, whatever convolutional layer you want to use, you have to change this function here, aggregate, okay? Uh, we, we have seen that it's actually very easy because uh, in uh, 23 lines, I have implemented a totally new way uh, of, for instance, uh, aggregating. So it's a very easy uh, task to do. Okay, so now let's test our new aggregation strategies. Uh, this is simply um, an example that I've taken from the Python geometric um, uh, repository. So uh, here I will not go into detail on uh, here, all the training, testing, and the uh, um, optimization procedure. Uh, here, basically, uh, what I'm going to show you is simply that uh, we are gonna basically implement three different uh, networks, okay, which implement our versions of the convolution. So basically, gene laugh convolution is the class implementing the gene convolution with the laugh aggregation. Uh, the same goes for the PNA. So here we have uh, the PNA network, the gene with the PNA convolu uh, sorry, with the PNA aggregation, and also the third uh, network that we are gonna use is the simple uh, gene convolution as uh, basically um, as explained in the PyTorch geometric um, library. So, okay, let's execute these pieces of code. Okay, here uh, at last, uh, we basically now are gonna test it on this uh, mutagenesis uh, data set that uh, it's, okay. And um, so basically here, uh, we can make it run very easily. So here I put for you uh, this net variable, which basically allows you to select if you wanna use laugh convolution, PNA convolution or gene convolution. So basically here now we are running it with laugh, but then we can, we can switch it to um, PNA or gene very easily. So you can maybe uh, try it out uh, by yourself and uh, test new some new other things. Um, okay, so I think for for this tutorial uh, it's everything. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope I made clear the concepts. And if you have any questions, please uh, go on and ask. Thank you, Joan. Sorry, I, I 
was a bit lost in the last part because the the connection was okay. uh, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not so good. I don't know if it was my fault. Um, no, I, I guess it's my fault. Anyway, it was, <laughs> no, so I don't know if you already said that, but uh, um, can you, uh, I don't know, um, think about some examples where it is better to use one function instead of another one? Um, I mean for aggregation. Okay, yes. Uh, well, for instance, um, if you, uh, well, for the, actually you should uh, think about uh, how the functions behave by themselves. So basically, uh, for instance, using the maximum, okay, uh, is a function in which if you have an outlier, uh, everything will be basically um, absorbed by uh, that outlier, okay, every type of information. Uh, it should also be very tied uh, to the type of uh, structural information that uh, you're gonna analyze because there are um, some structures that uh, some functions can actually um, discriminate and uh, some other functions that, uh, that uh, cannot discriminate certain type of structures. Um, so basically uh, that, that is something that um, should really be based on uh, on your type of application. Um, this is in principle why, for instance, in, in my work, we propose this solution, uh, because if you don't know this kind of uh, information and you still want to perform meaningful aggregation, uh, you might um, it might be better to learn it from the data instead of choosing uh, choosing uh, the aggregation function uh, a priori, which might be the, the, the wrong one, let's say. Thank you, Giovanni.